It's good news that God's in control. As Jesus said, the Spirit blows where it will. And that means that God's purposes can't be thwarted by our failure or our imperfection. And that's good news, and it brings with it a freedom to act. Imagine if it were the opposite, that the whole thing was dependent on our perfection and our success. Then this, the burden of that responsibility might grind us down to the point where we did nothing. So the good news brings freedom. But with that freedom also comes the need to sift what we're doing because of human imperfection. And you could read the whole history of the church through the the lens of freedom and a need to restrain the freedom or better to sift it. Hi, I'm Warren, director here at St. Columbus. Glad you could join me for my message of the day. Here at St. Columbus, we're reading during Lent very closely the first two chapters of the book of Acts. And on Sunday, we read chapter 1, verses 12 to 26. And you could pause right now, if you like, to read through that. In that chapter, in those few few verses, we're told about the way in which the apostles devoted themselves to prayer, and then they turned to replacing Judas as one of the twelve. And we're told that about the way that Judas died, which is very different than how we are told he died in Matthew chapter 27. And then we get the process through which uh, a, new, a new apostle is chosen. And we're given, I think, three criteria. And the, the person had to be with them right from the beginning, from the beginning of the baptism of John, uh, right through and to the ascension, and then also be able to witness to the resurrection of Jesus. Interestingly, St. Paul wouldn't have made it by those, that criteria. By the time of Luke, the, the, the idea of an apostle had been narrowed down. It was, it was wider than that earlier on. So in the time of Paul, Paul thought of himself as an apostle. But we get other people called apostles who weren't part of the Twelve, like Paul. Uh, Andronicus and Junior in Romans 16, 7. In the book of Acts, Paul and Barnabas are called apostles. Uh, in Paul's letters, he talks of some of his co-workers as apostles. They are apostles to churches, you know, by which he means messengers, missionaries. And so, in this this segment of the book of Acts that we were reading on Sunday, we get this process. So, two people are chosen, and then lots are cast to decide which one of those two would be the one who would become a member of the Twelve. That caused a little bit of disquiet on Sunday to think that uh, such an important thing might be decided uh, by the irrational, what seems to be an irrational process of throwing lots, you know, a double six and it's this guy, a double five and it's this one instead. Uh, but it has a, uh, a precedent in Scripture, in the Old Testament, when the Israelites take control of the land, the promised land. The land is divided up amongst the, the tribes by the casting of lots. Uh, Saul is chosen as king by the casting of lots. Proverbs talks about the way in which the casting of lots can enable the will of God to be discerned. Um, there are other examples. Uh, so anyway, the the this process, because it is a process, uh, if you read the passage, you'll see that two people are chosen. Presumably there were some more, but these two were discerned by the group to be appropriate candidates, and then lots were cast. It's sort of like uh, what I was saying, a, a, a bit of a tension between freedom and process. That's important for us here at St. Columbus as we we sit together and over Lent to sift our own freedom as a church and as people to act because we want to uh, be inspired by, to, to understand what the Spirit is asking us to do. 
Yet we also, being an Anglican church, put ourselves in a process that uh, tries to stop us making uh, some kind of crazy decision by rolling a double six, so to speak. Um, but also, not just to stop us doing something crazy, but to gather us together so that we can all be part of a, of a sensible decision that, that might, in some way, further God's purposes. But as we do this, we should always remember, remember that the promise is not that what we do is going to be what God wants. Uh, as Anglicans, we don't think that anybody, any process, any council is ever foolproof. Of course, the promise is that God can work through us. God can work around us. God can build on what we do. God can maintain what we do. Sometimes God can disrupt what we do. The promise, though, is that God is with us. Uh, the Spirit blows where it will. Thanks for joining me.